Mariella, and I'm super excited to jump into this next hour with you. Um, if you're just joining us, we were just chatting offline and getting to know a little bit about each other, at least where we're calling from. And I was chatting with our guest speaker offline as well. So I'm super excited to learn with her and le learn with you all um, and learn a lot from her today. Um, so I just wanna start by saying thank you for taking the hour out of your day to join us live. I know that a lot of crazy things are going on in the world. So um, I appreciate you sharing time with us. Um, and then with that said, I'll just go over some housekeeping rules so that we all feel comfortable and we can really maximize uh, the hour together. So um, I really encourage everyone to participate. I know we live in a multitasking world, uh, but uh, it'd be great if you could be present with us uh, and ask your questions or respond to some of the things that we're talking about today. Um, and with that said, uh, I've, I've muted everyone upon entrance just to avoid, uh, avoid background noise, but feel free to come off of mute um, whenever you want. I'm gonna sound like a broken record by the end of the chat. I want to hear from you. I wanna hear your voice. So turn your cameras on um, if you feel inclined to do so. Don't worry, I didn't shower today. We're in quarantine here in Buenos Aires. So, you know, it's all good. There will be, there will be no judgment here. Um, and if anyone wants to keep anything sensitive, um, you can write to me anonymously. You can find me in the chat box under Mariella. Um, and then this is being recorded. So again, be present with us and then you can rewatch this video. You can take notes, um, you know, to your leisure. Um, and then follow us on socials, Power to Fly and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you do come off of mute, you will be in our live recording. Just wanna let you know. So with that said, great. I hope we have a great hour today with you. And I'm just gonna pass the mic to our guest speaker today, Amy. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, how you came to know about Power to Fly and what you're excited to share today. Yeah, um, so I have been in the tech industry for about 15 years now. Um, learned a lot in those 15 years being a web person wasn't even a degree you could get in at college yet. Um, so kind of a self-starter, but it's been an awesome journey and I'm super excited to share my experience with you guys. Um, I heard about Power to Fly from my mentor and friend, Taylor, uh, Taylor Elizabeth Lane. She's fantastic. And I was thinking about, I was explaining to her, I was curious about getting into sharing the knowledge now that I've been in the industry for so long. And I really want to help see other people succeed and specifically women and specifically women of color in tech, because I think they're really underrepresented. And she was like, oh my God, I have the perfect place, power to fly. We got to hook you up. And she of course hooked me up and Nicole reached out and we just had an amazing chat. She was like, yes, you're perfect. Let's do this. And I had all these ideas of what I was going to talk on and and like negotiation and, and salary raises wasn't even on my radar. And we got to that. And she's like, uh, you need to talk about that. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Sometimes I forget, you know, like that this isn't everybody's experience and the stuff that I've learned isn't necessarily common sense. It's almost counterintuitive. So I'm, I'm really excited to dig in. And, and the questions that I previewed look awesome. So I can't wait to get, get my hands into them and kind of sink my teeth into it. And, Yes, great. So speaking of that, uh, you all have sent some great questions offline. We are going to take this hour to walk uh, through these questions one by one. So if you see your question pop up on the screen, feel free to come off of mute. If it's not your question and you want to add to it, you had a dream last night and you want to share something now, feel free to drop in the chat box or unmute yourself um, so that we can really keep this engaging. And, you know, um, again, we have an hour, it's going to fly by, you know, like really quickly. So I'm going to sound like a broken record to remind everyone. <laughs> All right. So let's take this first question here. Where do you begin when thinking about your salary and worth? Um, so one of the things that I found really, um, powerful is you really have to consider mindset first, because if you don't believe that you're worth more, your chances are really low of succeeding that you're actually going to get more. Um, so foundationally, step zero, because I'm a dev, zero is the first spot. Um, you really need to have your brain uh, in line with that. And if you don't really believe that you actually deserve that money or you can get it, that's where you need to start. If you're already there, then the next place is logical to go and just start doing research. Um, that's where I tend to land of like, if I can go and figure out what the pay ranges are, I'll go to like glassdoor.com, find out, I'll type in different titles that match or are similar or overlap with things that I do, find those pay ranges. And then I always avoid going straight for the middle. I think naturally we think, oh, well, the middle is safe. That's like where I should aim for. Don't aim for that, aim for higher. <laughs> like, um, there really is no limit except the limit that you set for yourself. And so when you're doing this research, 
just start tracking some of that stuff. See what people um, online are saying. If you know people that are in the industry and have those titles that you're looking at or you have experience, ask them. Um, a lot of times you'll find that even though it's like not PC or cool to like ask what other people are making, a lot of people are open to it, uh, at least giving you an idea, like maybe not specifically down to the dollar, but they'll be like, I make in this range, you can expect something in that range. Um, I've done that myself and I found it really helpful. Another thing that's been really helpful too is I build really um, strong relationships with my managers or my clients. I've done freelance and corporate um, and education and building those strong relationships. It's actually really nice to be able to ask them um, because sometimes like in education, they have a range that they can work within and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Um, to shift out of that. There is some, so I will tell you it's not a hard stop, um, but it is harder to get bigger raises there in the education system. So you kind of barter with other stuff. Um, but research is generally the way I go if you already get the mindset that you actually deserve it and are worth it. I love that you bring the, the question back to ourselves, like uh, where are you and how can you try to, you know, get what you think you what you what you think is impossible just to prove that you can to yourself kind of like going there yeah. um and i just want to also really i mean it's really it's really interesting I me mean, now we're calling from all over i'm just going to shout out some some places that we've written here in the chat box so i i want to when i finish i'd love to hear your perspective on like taking this and thinking of how like lots of things are going remote pre-covid and especially now mm -hmm. so how to be like you know okay i'm this like, you know, how to just make sense of that with a proper mindset so that you don't confine yourself when we're working remotely in tech. So um, I'm calling from Argentina. I, our guest speaker is calling from Bend, Oregon. Um, we've got some folks calling from all over. So I'm just gonna give a shout out here. Um, we've got Venezuela, uh, North Carolina, Minneapolis, Berlin, Charleston, South Carolina, Minneapolis, Portland, Oregon, New Jersey, Boston, Brooklyn, uh, Germany, Chicago, great. So. You know, just I feel like we're all kind of in this um, limbo between obviously all the crazy things that are going on in the world and how work is is evolving. Um, and so salary should definitely be a part of that conversation. Right. And so things are uh, becoming more accessible online. Um, and I love that we're calling from a very diverse, you know, territory of the world. Um, so, yeah, I would love to hear from everyone's opinion um, as Amy is going deep on these questions. So um, do you want to respond to any of that? Um, so working remotely, I think that there's kind of this belief that because it's more convenient for you, it should mean less income for you. Um, and I actually would argue that it's the opposite. I think that when you work remotely, you're saving the company the finances that they need to have you on site. Um, and I think that assuming that you have the skills to successfully work remotely, you actually often are more efficient and more valuable. Um, so don't limit the income that you think you can get just because the position will be remote. Um, or if you're gonna ask for it to be remote. I mean, the position I have now actually was not meant to be a remote position. Um, they reached out to me just kind of initially and I was like, I am only interested in remote work right now because I'm moving from Minnesota to Oregon. Are you open to that? And they said, yeah, we'll consider it. So, um, and like that didn't affect my salary at all. It was based on my qualities and what I know my worth is and what the research I had done. And I remember like this was one of my 60% jumps where, you know, my voice is a little, it's a, a man that's interviewing me and I don't have a huge professional relationship with him because he's just brought me in to like interview me. Um, and he asked what my salary range and it's like, you, you can feel the like nerves in your throat. Just like, <laughs> I'm going to say this number, <laughs> like, but you get it out and then they're like, yeah, okay, great. And just keep going. And like, sometimes it's just like, just get it out. <laughs> um, and you'll be amazed at what people will do. And sometimes you get people that are like, no. <laughs> Um, which is okay. And it's actually good to get those because I feel like that's when you know you're actually getting to the point of finding that top level of what you can get at that time. Um, and it shows you the companies that you want to work with where they're like, yes, you are worth that. And others who are like, no, we, we're not going to pay that. So I think I got helps a little. <laughs> it helps you kind of clear the obstacles you now, like going for the target that you want. 
Um, yeah. I love that that you. I love everything that you said there. Um, I'm I'm gonna flag a question here. This is a great question as well. Thanks, Katie, for for writing this. Uh, I thought salary for remote positions would be tailored to the cost of living where you live. Is that not true? That's not true across the board. Um, so there's a lot of places that say, okay, you're in San Francisco, you need to make a cost of living there. And you can argue for that if they aren't paying attention to that. Um, but I would actually argue that if you're in a smaller town that isn't as expensive, you're still worth that income. Um, so some companies are implementing it based on where you're at, but it's not all. And there's always room for negotiation in my opinion. Awesome. And then great follow-up question, Madison, how do you prepare to hear and respond to no? That's uh, an interesting one. And I, I kind of love that part because that's where you go. You like start having those imagination moments of like, okay, what are they going to think isn't going to make this possible? Like, oh, there's budget restrictions. Oh, there's COVID. Oh, we're having issues with other employees. Um, so if you can guess what those things are going to come up for them already, then you can start actually planning your response ahead of time. So it's not on the spot of, well, I don't know what the budget is. I don't know that kind of stuff. Um, you can start kind of coming up with how you're going to answer how it might be possible to still give you a raise, even if they are having um, salary freezes, for example, for COVID, because they're just unsure. It's different if it's like a company that's been completely squashed by COVID, you know, then there's not a whole lot of room to stuff to negotiate there necessarily. Um, but if it's more out of, we're just unsure, then I feel like there's always a chance to, to, to push the line and be prepared for those questions that are just normal, kind of like, well, what if, what if, what if? And if you have those answers already planned, then you can get through that and beyond. Um, if it's just a flat out no, that's a learning lesson. So you can actually, you know, it's not a personal judgment on you. I would say 95% of the time. Um, so it's, it's remembering that it's not you that they're saying no to, it's your request. And then if you do hear no, ask those follow-up questions of, okay, well, what brings you to that answer? Is there a way that we might be able to renegotiate in six months, in a year? Um, is there a way that I could do a different title so I could get a title promotion that would then get you bigger money later on? Um, that's valuable. Is there something that they can compensate you with that isn't necessarily money? Maybe it's more vacation days. Maybe it's a more flexible schedule. Um, so you know, it's looking at those different kind of benefits too that even if you get a no on the money, that doesn't mean they can't do other stuff for you. I love that you don't just halt the conversation there. It's it's good to, you know, and I love that you went back to kind of like that number being stuck in your throat and you kind of just like getting it out there. Oh, yeah. um, and I think that we should expect that it is there if, you know, if they are respectable people, they should be like, thank you and go and ponder about it and come back with an answer instead of being like, hell no, like right there in the minute. And I think that that's what keeps the thing in your throat too, you know, like, you're like okay, they might just shut this down right now. And then I'm going to just be so what embarrassed and all these things. So um, to prepare for the no, knowing like that this is coming from your, your mindset and your practice and that um, I think that can be like comforting. <laughs> yeah. You know, and if you're working with the right people, having these kinds of discussions shouldn't be a scary, bad thing. Like you shouldn't expect them to be like, fuck no. <laughs> I don't know if I can swear, but like, do you know what I mean? They're not going to have that like super intense, angry response. It's going to be an actual genuine conversation of let's talk about this. Why do you feel this? You know? And if it's a no, likely they're going to be like, I'm so sorry, but we just can't right now. And it's like, okay. I, you know, knew that was a possibility, but let's dig into that of why. And sometimes, you know, I've had responses where it's like, yeah, it's just not the time. And once we dig into it, they're like, oh, well, maybe I just didn't think about it that way. Cause like a lot of times they're like, oh, wait until you have your review. Then we know our budget and all this. And I actually say, don't wait for the review. Cause by the time you have the review, they already know how much they're saving and they've already divvied it up. <laughs> like it's too late. <laughs> um, so you want to go kind of outside of the normal schedule and system. And especially this is where it comes into play to have really good relationships with your management or your clients. If you're a freelancer of being able to have um, just the comfort and knowledge in, in having them be your partner 
to find a successful answer versus a, I am begging you for something, right? Um, when it becomes a partnership of, I've got your back, you've got mine, here's what I want. Here's what I'd like to see. Here's why I think I own, I deserve this. Here's what my research is. You know, and sometimes I was talking to a friend recently and she was like, I just don't feel like my manager would advocate that hard for me. And I said, yeah, that's a tough one. And so one of the things you could do is almost create a little cheat sheet for them so that it's not them like trying to interpret or represent your words. You can literally have them read off a sheet or hand it to their manager if they're uncomfortable having those conversations because they're human too. To them, that's probably like, oh, the money talk uh, too, you know? And so then it helps kind of keep that message, not be a telephone game, but be like, here's actual information that they found out. We really value them. Then it's easier to kind of get the ball rolling. I love that persuasion but like in in the in the right way like you're not trying to bamboozle anyone and like you know you're you're showing and doing the work which I love that you're taking that perspective and I love I did this I I don't remember who exactly mentioned this before and I'm trying I think sometime last year and they mentioned this work uh like employer employee relationship as a partnership which was like the first time I had heard of it that way and thinking of just like how that just automatically changes the 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 like I don't know the the your, the way that you interact with it because if it's like I'm not just like working for you I like you're working with me so that I can achieve something so you can achieve something um so I love that you bring it back to like you know how do how do you approach salary in that way thinking of it like you know let's start working on this partnership and if they're going to be you know bad to you or mean to you you know you wouldn't you know don't fall in love with anyone like that don't go to work with anyone like that I love that and I think people uh, forget that they have power um even if they're in a stereotypical submissive situation on the ladder that doesn't mean they don't have power because they have a voice and so because of that voice and the ability to communicate and have relations like the what limits you is what you can imagine and so for me that's again why research has always been really valuable as i start looking and i go oh my god i could make this much money or oh i'm really kind of underpaid here <laughs> or you know i can remember like my first job i i was just out of college i had no idea what it took to live you know like two thousand dollars was an extreme amount of money right and so they're like what did, what do you want for your salary and i was like twenty thousand dollars <laughs> and they're like we no, we're going to at least give you 25. And I was like, oh, okay. You know? <laughs> and then of course I started the job and I was like, this is, this isn't even enough to live off of, you know? And so then I started to really understand and think about like, how do I know what my ceiling is? And then I realized there isn't a ceiling. Um, there's just a different path. So either you get to a place where you really like where you are and it matches what the money is and you're happy um, and that might last a really long time or it might last a short time. But once you're not happy there anymore, then it's time to bump it up and find out other ways that you can get this extra money and increase your hang on. Money makes a lot of happiness possible. <laughs> you know, it gets a bad rep, but money is really neutral, right? It's not um, a, a value judgment on anyone that has it or doesn't have it. You know, there's terrible people that are rich and there's wonderful people that are rich and the same for poor people. So there's also kind of a money mindset that goes around there too in that, you know, you have to fight the idea of like, you're being greedy if you ask for more, you're being needy if you ask for more, or like, who are you to, to want more, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's a lot of inner work as well. Absolutely, I love that. And we have a follow-up question here from Megan. Uh, how do you have those conversations if your company doesn't have a review process set up? Uh, that's where I rely on the relationships again. So like I, I have managers um, who are genuine friends. And so often it was like hanging out in my office or at my desk and just like, hey, so I know we don't really have reviews, but I think we're doing really good. Are you really proud of the work I'm doing? If not, like you can ask for your own review. It doesn't have to be official. Um, and you can also, if you have that kind of relationship, say, I would really like a raise. I feel like I am worth more and there's a capability there. Uh, if you don't have that kind of a relationship, I would recommend fostering one. Um, but if you don't have it and want to continue, I would ask for uh, a review. It doesn't have to be from HR or from the company as a policy. Um, there's nothing wrong with asking 
for a performance review of how you're doing and getting a gauge of like, what do they think about your work and what you bring to the company? And if it's amazing, then that's your like flag to be like, okay, <laughs> now we can play. <laughs> I love that. Now we can play. Absolutely. Um, and I want to ask, how do you, okay, so you're, you're speaking about your connections, um, your relationships, and obviously the work behind your, your what you do. Um, but how do you like, and uh, how do you prepare your voice to like be confident? Um, and this is really interesting for me because I, I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in Argentina right now and I'm from Los Angeles and what's happened, it's like kind of like this crazy thing is happening where I'm like, I'm not there, I wanna be there, but what can I say? How can I do something to be like a part of the revolution basically? And um, so I studied performance theater and film. And so one of the things that I'm offering now as a service is uh, connecting with your voice to speak from confidence so that if you're at a protest or you need to ask for more money or you need to whatever, because I find it very easy because I've trained my body and my voice, you know, to for, for a very long time to do this. And I wanna, and, and I've had such great um, folks coming to me, just like, I wanna like come closer to just like say what I need to say and not damage myself or not hurt my voice or hurt, you know, other people. Um, so anyway, I say that to say, if anyone wants to work with me on that, you can connect with me on LinkedIn or you can write to me at Mariella Marie at Gmail. And I, you know, I want to support Amy. I love what you're doing. Um, and I love that you're so uh, sure about it, you know, and, uh, and it's very, and we have in the chat box here, thanks for sharing your story. And I agree. It's nice to be um, a message that you're sharing is to, you know, have conversations openly um, and ask people, you know, if they can, I think that it's a, such a taboo thing. And I think this is something from a, a past generation of not like sharing that information because that keeps certain people out and it keeps certain people continuing to make all of the, the decisions. Um, I'd love to hear your opinion on that. Well, I think that, you know, historically not talking about money also kind of comes from, yes, the like keeping a person where they are, but also there's this perception of if you're too successful, it might come back to bite you if you're like loud and proud. Um, so I think that there's also nervousness on the other side of that, of like sharing, okay, well, I make good money, um, but I don't know if this person's going to be judgy about it or have issues with it or, you know, and, you know, hopefully not more. Um, so I think that there's a lot of history there, but I think that, and this applies to a lot of things in life, especially right now, um, with you know all the politics that's going on and Black Lives Matter and the the polar opposites that seem so intense right now, I find a lot of comfort in reminding myself that we're all human, um, and not to say that there aren't challenges because there are major challenges that need to be addressed and rectified, <laughs> but um, healing begins by having human to human conversations of I have a differing opinion. Um, what is your opinion and can we discuss it respectfully? Um, because that to me is where the real change happens. It's not the, I'm the loudest person or I am the most gifted person or whatever. Um, it's about connecting human to human and remembering that people who are in power, whether it be within a company or whether it be in a government are people, they're not superhuman. They're not um, the most intelligent people in the world that got put there because they passed a test, they're human. And so, you know, once you kind of take them off that pedestal and realize that they're just another person and you start talking to them like a normal person, um, there becomes a lot more opportunity to have this kind of empathic human experience of like, you are a person, I'm a person, let's work together to try to make something better whether that's our politics or whether that's the money that we make at our job. Yes, I love the E word, <laughs> ethics. It's huge, it's a big missing part of everything in the world. And so please, I love that you bring that up. Uh, please take that. If you don't remember anything else on this hour, <laughs> and I love that, I always say a good chat is, you know, we can speed through the questions and like really be superficial about things, but I love that everyone is asking follow-up questions and we're, you know, we are, clearly this is a really hot topic. So um, I just also wanna say that I want Amy to come back and I'm gonna try to convince the Power to Fly team as well. So if we don't get through all these questions, um, Nicole, I hope that's okay, she's listening now. Um, we can have 
back to, to continue answering more. So um, we have a follow-up question here uh, in the chat box. Uh, do you think it's true? Do you think it's true that if you set your value higher by asking for a higher salary, that it makes you look like a more skilled or desirable candidate? I still struggle with the greedy, needy thought. Yeah. So there's two different things in there. There's the greedy, needy thought, which is mindset, which is, you know, it's tough work. You've got to dig into it. I have a companion document that's going to get sent out with the email later to try to have some resources and some prompts to kind of help you think about those things. Um, but the, sorry, <laughs> just zoned out on the, the first part of the question. Um, uh, oh, if so you value higher by asking for a higher salary, it makes you look like. Yeah, so here's one of those things that um, I realized fairly early on in my post-college career. Um, the people at the top aren't necessarily smarter than me. They're not necessarily more skilled than me. Um, there's plenty that I saw that I was like, why do you have that job? Like, and I'm sure that we've all run across people and that's not to be bitchy or mean, but it's just to like recognize, like it doesn't always match. Right. And so the higher value you place on yourself and your work and your worth also affects how other people view you. So if your energy isn't there that like, I am worth this money, and your energy is like, I'm worth this money. They're going to be like, are you? I don't know. <laughs> like, uh, but if you're confident about it and you're like, I am worth this money, the response that you'll get will be a lot more positive and a lot more like, okay, she says she's worth it. So yeah, I think she is. I've seen her work. It looks great. I'm excited. Let's do this. And they're happy to pay that fee too, because you believe it. They believe it. It's, it's a set expectation now, or it's, it's a fact um, versus you think you are you, you probably should be, but you're not confident yet. And so that confidence isn't radiating through where they really want to like, yeah, you are, you know, they're like, um, you're unsure. Now I'm unsure. And now I feel weird. <laughs> like, um, so the more comfortable and confident you can be, but yes, you have high value. Yes. You deserve it. Yes. You are a deserving and good human being. Um, the better off you will be and the, and the more your money will increase. I love that. I love that. And just to keep us going here, we've still got some questions in the chat box, but I'm also move uh, into this next question here that was submitted offline. So how do you know how much to ask for or what's your go-to for market medium pay for specific jobs? I know you tapped into this a little bit, but if you want to go deeper here or if anyone else wants to chime in, feel free to do so. Yeah, so there's a few things that kind of factor into it. Um, I mentioned Glassdoor. I think there's like a few others. I've got them linked, um, but you can do a Google search for salary research. And one thing I would say on this is what's your go-to for market median pay is I don't focus on the median pay. That's an average. That's not a rule. Um, so I, I go for what is the ballpark range? I knock off all of the lower half because no. <laughs> um, and then you start asking kind of high is what I focus on. Like, you don't want to be crazy about it. I mean, you can, you might get lucky. You might find the person that's like, yeah, okay. Um, but I tend to go for like 75 ish percent average a bunch across a bunch of sites, or there are books that are out there um, for salaries. There's articles and there's people. So you have actual people that you are connected with, whether it's on LinkedIn or actual friends and family, ask them ask them for a ballpark range uh, or even, you know, not necessarily what they make, but what the title makes. Right. And so then it's focusing on that. You know, I go for like a three quarter rule. Um, and I try to kind of have an understanding of similar jobs that are re relative um, that I have skills for. Do they pay more or less? Can I bump it up a bit? Um, and then a lot of times, you know, companies won't necessarily be afraid to be like, hey, that's a little high for us. Here's our, and then they'll tell you the full range that they're working with, which I've, I've had this multiple times, um, where if you're low, they're like, oh, that's great. And you don't hear anything else. But if you're on the high end or over it, they're like, well, here's what our pay range is. And they literally tell you, which you, they're not advertising anywhere yet, usually. And then you can go, okay, well, the top of that, what are your requirements to meet that if you meet it? Um, are you as a person okay with what top range? Is it enough? Will you be happy with that? Um, is the job going to be great for you? Don't forget that you're half of this um, equation, right? So it needs to make you happy too. It's not just about being 
a, a helpful employee to an employer. Hopefully that helps. I love that. Yeah, and I love that you're always kind of making this about it being a two-way street because, you know, there are two separate minds involved. And I just want to flag a couple of things that are happening in the chat box that I love uh, that are being raised here. Um, so uh, Colleen says, I think asking for an evaluation is great as it puts the shoe on the other foot. It puts your manager in a situation to say how well you're doing as opposed to you putting the words in his or her mouth. Uh, once he or she validates your position, it's a great time to talk salary increase. Awesome. And okay. then we had Joan agree with Colleen saying uh, developing relationships with managers are, idea, I, are ideal. However, everything is a two-way street. Some simply don't want to or they pick and choose. Um, even doing what she's, what you're talking about now doesn't work with some managers. So how, how do you deal with that kind of manager um, who is kind of not really like giving you the bone? <laughs> yeah, so if they're the kind of like we don't have a personal relationship type manager, which there's a lot that still kind of believe that. I feel like they're getting phased out because it's not as popular to do that anymore, but they're still around. Um, and those are always the ones where it's like, you do all the research, you document your successful projects. Um, I've even gone as far uh, to talk to clients, whether that's you know internal like coworkers that you've just done work for, or if they're external clients or freelance clients, to tell them or find out like how you're doing with them. Um, and if they're really happy with the work that you're doing, ask them to tell your manager. Um, and that's not outside of what's okay, in my opinion, because more than more often than not, they're like, oh my God, I'd love to, you know, they just get really excited and they're like, I'm going to cheer for you, you know, and it, it becomes this kind of like teamwork of let's get you these accolades that we think you totally deserve. Um, and then once your manager, who's very, you know, anti-personal on a relationship, starts seeing all of that, then it becomes facts, right? So it's facts of, okay, well, our clients really like her or our coworkers really value the work that she's providing. Um, you know, it's those kind of things that start kind of building up this energy of like, oh crap, I need to like hang on to that one because everybody loves them. They're doing amazing work. We should probably work to keep them right and so when you are set up that way then you can go to them with your research and your facts of you know why you think that you why you believe that you deserve a raise then it's not about personal there's nothing emotional about it um it's it's an exchange of here's the information here's the research we know that i do great work what do you say <laughs> I love that. It's like, um, I remember when I first heard about, and it made so much sense to like start making a brag folder, but for like to keep to yourself so that you can even remind yourself in those moments what to maybe like remind, you know, your, your manager about in the case that of LinkedIn too. Say it again. Um, and put it on your LinkedIn because there's accomplishment sections there of like, put in your projects, put in your wins that becomes public. So even if um, say you don't, you aren't able to get the raise that you want in your current job. A secret that I always have and has worked out amazing for me is setting my LinkedIn profile to available. So you're not actively searching, but people, you will show up in people's search results for potential jobs. Um, and then that section becomes really tangible information for people who are hiring for positions because then they don't even have to know, they can just read it on your LinkedIn. And if it's validated by a coworker, that's even better. And if you have any concerns about current jump company finding out, um, they have some protections on LinkedIn of not showing that you're available for hire. But then there's also, um, if they ask you, you can say, I'm not, I'm not actively looking, but I'm always open to opportunity because who's gonna argue that you can't be open to opportunity? <laughs> And if they I do, they need to GTFO. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Okay, so Joan here um, has apparently also tried and is a fan of the brag folder. She started one, or he started one about three months ago. And yes, uh, put her wins or his wins and moved everything to LinkedIn. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next question here. Oops, I think I, I need to go back. I went, I got too excited. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so, how accurate is the salary comparison information on career sites such as Glassdoor? Well, um, 
you know, I don't know the actual statistics, like I'm not in charge of the data, so I can't say for sure. But what I can speak to is my experience of comparing it to my salaries throughout, you know, the last 15 years of tech industry. I've found it to be generally pretty accurate. Um, and I've found that the more my confidence raises, the more I feel like I am worth it, the more I start edging um, into the higher section. Um, so I've found that it's, it's, it's guidance enough, true enough to base my requests off of, and I have. But if you I want love more that. detail than that, I would say Google it. <laughs> Yeah. And also, yeah, I mean, it's also about kind of, and this is, I'd also love to use this opportunity for everyone who's joining us live to drop in the chat box, their LinkedIn or their preferred way of kind of connecting and getting in touch so that we can put some of these things into practice. Now. Um, I, I think that, you know, these times are really different and crazy. And so it's better to work together. And especially if we're learning about empathy and like having open conversations, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm Mariella Marie, Amy, we'll, we'll let you know at the end of the chat, how to connect with Amy in lots of different ways. But if you're on the call, we want to hear from you. So write in the chat box, how you prefer for people to connect with you. Um, and then we've got a great follow-up question here. Um, Jessica says, this conversation is great. I've seen friends, especially college professors who will apply for other jobs at other locations and they will interview at another school to get a raise or promotion at their current job. Yep. Do you want to keep me? Here's what they're willing to give me. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And does it work in other industries? I love it and heck yeah, it works in other industries. <laughs> Um, you know, there's nothing as valuable as when somebody else wants it to, <laughs> you know, it, it like puts this urgency on it and this extra level of value on it where they kind of go, oh crap, you know, like they, they already have another offer. How are we going to keep them? Especially if you've been doing the, you know, clients are going and telling them how great you are. You are reinforcing really good work and proving value for coworkers and whatever. Um, it becomes a really great bartering tool of like, and I've done this. I have personally done this at jobs where I say I have, I did this other interview. They contacted me because I had my profile set to open to opportunities. They're offering this. I would like to stay here, but that's a lot of money to turn down. Can we work on this? You know, what can we do to, you know, first of all, do you want to keep me? Hopefully they do. I would assume so. Um, and if they do, then it's like, okay, well, how do we work through this? Because I really want to stay, but clearly I am valued more monetarily at this place or whatever, if it's vacation. Um, and then sit down and work with them and see if you can find a, an improved solution and stay where you like it already. Um, it's a great bartering tool. I love that you mentioned if they even want you anyway. And so I'm going to flag this question here that Allison has written here in the chat box. Um, I have heard a manager say that they don't give them more money because if they're at the point where they are looking elsewhere, then they're on their way out the door anyway. Yeah, I've heard that too. Um, so I think that's all about in the presentation of how it's done. Um, and it, it's basing it off of, you know, your manager style too. So if, if they just across the board believe that, you know, you're not going to change their mind. Um, but if you genuinely want to stay where you're at and you did an interview to see what's out there, um, which again, the right kind of people that you're working with should not fault you for learning what's possible for you, because ultimately you are an employee. It is your life. It is your time. It is your money. It's about you and your happiness. Right. And so if you want to see if there's something better out there, you might not find that there's anything better and that's okay, at least you learned it. Um, if you do, or you find something that's like not better, but they offered you more, you don't have to go to your current manager and be like, well, I got this other job and, and they wanna pay me more. What are you gonna do? Like, that's not gonna go over well, right? But if you go to them and you're like, hey, these people reached out to me. I entertained an interview because I you know, just wanted to see what it's like out there. And they came back with a higher amount of money. Um, I'm really not super interested in leaving. I really like working for you. I like my coworkers. I like the spot we're in, whatever. Um, is there something that you would be open to doing to improve my pay here? Again, the worst they're gonna say is no. Um, and if they're the type that's terrible and is like, you're fired, <laughs> which they should not do, <laughs> um, you don't want to work there anyways, and you should take the other job, find out if that's better. 
I love that. Thank you everyone for dropping your LinkedIn uh, links here in the chat. I really appreciate that. Um, all right, so let's move on to the next question here. And just so that everyone knows, we've got just a little over 15 minutes left. So if you have not um, had a chance to write in the chat box yet, or you want to tick yourself off of mute, now's your time to shine. You've got 15 minutes. So uh, until then, I'll read this question here. So how do you know um, when it is appropriate to ask for a raise? Say I've been at my job for a few months, have picked it up uh, very quickly, and have been taking on more leadership responsibility and workload but the usual significant promotion pay raise doesn't occur until two to three years in my career. Should I ask anyway? Um, yeah, so definitely. If you are learning really fast um, and you're taking on more responsibility already, yeah, absolutely. Um, the ideal situation would be if you start and you know that you're gonna just kill it. Like sometimes you get these jobs and you're like, I'm gonna blow this away, it's gonna be great. Um, that's the time before you've even accepted the job to say, hey, I think I am very qualified for this. I think I'm going to do great. Are you open to promotions or raises soon, sooner rather than later, uh, based on performance? And they'll tell you, they'll be like, well, we're in a two to three cycle. We can't really go out that. Okay then you factor that into your accepting it because are you okay with working at the amount that you've been hired for for the next two to three years? Or are you not? Do you take the job or not take the job? Um, and then if you are able to get them to say, yeah, we'd be open to it. If you're doing really good, okay. Then you go, okay, well, like in six months or three months, you know, you start kind of bartering on the timeline so that you can get it locked in. And then even if you don't do it later, you're like, eh, whatever, or you're too scared, or you know, you don't think you're ready yet, quite yet. Um, it still gives you kind of a predefined intro into like, well, we talked about this when I got hired. It's been six months, so can we review? Um, then it's not awkward. It's not out of the blue. It's like they knew when they hired you that you were going to have this conversation, and you're holding them to it. Um, if it hasn't had that, then it's a little bit more challenging, but I would still say, depending on your relationship and your type of boss, I would still ask, because you're doing more work, you're creating a lot of value. It should equal more money. <laughs> and I'd love to hear your opinion as well, because I'm looking at it, I love your response, and I'm also looking at it from the other perspective of this person's question here, which I identify with because I am a person that overgives and I love to give, and then I end up like being burnt out or hurting myself or whatever, and I have to like take a step back and like breathe and like reflect and go through an existential crisis, <laughs> you know, but come balanced again. Um, I guess that's a part of, of my life at least. Um, and <laughs> So I, I kind of identify with like, you pick it up quickly and then like you take on more leadership roles and things like that. And at least what I've learned is you just got to stop taking, or I got to stop taking those leadership roles and moving up until it matches with the pay that they're ready to give. Maybe it's in two years, but cool until then don't, yeah. don't put that much work on, on myself until it lines up or go find somewhere else. Yeah. And that's, you know, so there's, a, that's definitely a path to of like, if you're not going to get any sort of compensation um for extra work don't do it that's your but your i think work. it's like not but what's what's confusing is you don't think of it as extra work like you are you pick something up quickly and then like you are basically give giving away money no what isn't it funny to think of it like that <laughs> well and giving away your time like your life time right um and that that's really what an a employment opportunity is. It's an exchange of your time for compensation. So it's very important to be aware of what efforts you're putting in and if it will actually pay off. And, you know, it doesn't have to be money. Maybe you work at a nonprofit and that's what feeds your soul. Do it. I'm not telling you not to do it, but just be aware that the extra energy you're putting into it, if it's worth it to you and be aware of it. Um, you know, and there's always times where it does make sense too. There's been in positions where I'm like, yep, I'll take it on. Yep, I'll take it on. Yep, I'll take it on. But knowing that then I can go back to them later and be like, here's all the things that I've taken on that weren't part of my original job. And I have rocked it, obviously, because, you know, we all rock it. <laughs> um, and so then it becomes a, okay, pay raise, uh, title increase, um, both. 
if you want to go for it, I've definitely done that too. Um, because then it's, it's a discussion, right? Again, it's about discussion and, and having those opportunities. And if you've already got all these things that you've been taking on, even if it's only been a few months and, you know, of course have that conversation. The worst they say is no, not right now. And then you just say when, <laughs> and they <laughs> might be like, yeah. And they might be like two to three years or they might be like, check back with me at nine months. You know, they, the right people are going to want to work with you and be a partner and not just write you off and be like, no, and never talk about it again, because it's not going to go away. Absolutely. Okay, good. We've got someone here who's written in the chat box. She agrees. Uh, we need to stop thinking that the extra things make us more valuable. We need to consider our, our own time first. What's best for us? Thank you for this. So mm -hmm. great. We've got some folks who are resonating. Um, and again, we've got just a little over uh, 10 minutes. So if you want to take yourself off of mute, um, we'd love to hear any stories or anecdotes or advice or tips and tricks um, that you have or responses. Um, so I'll just hold for a light pause because I know we got a lot of folks on the line and you seem really, really interested. So I want to give your voice a, a chance to shine. Um, so I'll hold for a light pause. If nobody has any questions, I'll go to the next slide. So just like, even light. if your voice is shaky, it's all right. Mine gets shaky plenty of times. <laughs> Like no one's going through anything right now. Like tomorrow, got to make a decision. Like, how do I do it tomorrow? <laughs> do some live therapy. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> right. I see, Colleen, did, did you want to speak? Go, go for it. So during COVID time, I'm changing industries, changing jobs here. And so do you have recommendations on how to negotiate a healthy salary given these COVID times and the unusual um, situation we're in these days? Yeah. Um, so interestingly enough, I don't think COVID changes the negotiation. Um, I think what changes it is the industry that you're working in. So if it's something that's been really hard hit by COVID, um, then it becomes a, is it all about compensation or is it also a mix of added benefits like extra vacation time, flexible time, that kind of thing? Because there is different ways to compensate for every company, despite what their policy may be, right? Nothing, even though they're like, we only give two weeks until you're five years or whatever. That's just a guideline. That's not actually a hard and fast rule. They can always change it and they do always change it for the higher ups. So don't be afraid to kind of barter that way. Um, if it's an industry that hasn't been af affected or has even, you know, grown dramatically, then absolutely hit them even harder because the people that they're going to be going after um, are going to be worth more because there's not as many um, tech people as there have been previously that have a ton of experience. And so some people are hunkering down and some people are like, I'll move, but it needs to be lots of money, right? I don't know what your industry is. Education. There's education. Okay. So education is a challenging one. Um, I think, but education does have a lot baked in as far as uh, compensation. So you might be able to, do you have a union? No, I'm not a um, faculty member. So I work in the business office. So it's the business side of education. Okay. Okay. Um, it would be interesting if you could connect with some people that already work there, if you have a specific school that you were thinking about yeah. and find out what the environment is. Cause some of them, like if it's a private school, chances are they're probably doing better than public schools, right? Yeah, I think um, what I find is that no matter which industry, cause I've been able to um, push myself to different industries with my business background, is that so many of them are hunkering down a little bit right now because of the uncertainty. So where, yes, they need to have holes or gaps in their striata of their company, but they're not yet ready to fill them because they just don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So I feel like there's a hesitation out there across yeah. a lot of industries, except for the ones that are doing really, really well. Yeah. And there definitely is. Um, and I guess one of the things that I've been focusing on is the industries that are growing. Um, there's a lot more opportunity there naturally. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I can't necessarily answer, unfortunately, how to get them to not hunker down, right? And let you in. Know that it's going to be good for you guys. Like, yeah. 
I don't have a magic answer for that, unfortunately. I appreciate it. Thanks. Of course. And it sure. sounds like Colleen, you said you've been able to use your business background to kind of, uh, you know, go transition to include different things. Um, maybe, maybe it's more about you in this case to like grow something that you like to do in addition to maybe their hard stop. I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, go for it. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next question here. I often struggle with knowing how to advocate for a higher pay rate. Uh, when applying for jobs and for pay raises in existing gigs, it's hard to know what is reasonable for bo both myself and the employer. Do you want to reflect on that one? So this one seems kind of like a repeat of the one a couple ago. Um, let's see. So asking for pay raises in existing gigs sounds almost like it's a freelance experience, um, which I haven't quite touched on yet. So perhaps I'll go at it from that angle. Um, so I used to do web design uh, on the side just to make extra money because I wasn't making a ton yet. <laughs> um, and so I learned a lot about how to set um, prices. There are books out there that specifically you can refer to on how to set prices. And then there's tons of articles on it. Um, one of, and I also talked to a lot of friends that were freelance um, and asked them what they charged. Some were, you know, like, oh, $25 an hour. And I'm like, mm -hmm, no. And others were like 75. And I'm like, eh, okay, 150 sounds really nice, but I'm not quite confident enough for that yet at the time. Um, and so I kind of started off at like 50 and then I had clients um, who were existing clients. And I said, hey, my rates are going to be going up in two months, just wanted to give you a heads up. Please let me know if you have any issues with that. And most of them were like, yeah, great, okay. <laughs> like, which to me was like, I was not charging enough. Um, and so I learned a, a valuable lesson there that I was leaving money on the table. My clients were happy to pay more, which was like a nice, cause it wasn't really hard to raise it, but also like, oh God, like how much money did I just miss out on that I could have had? Um, and so then the next time I did, I actually doubled my rates when I would start getting new clients uh, to 150 an hour. And some were like, oh, that's too much. I can't do it. And I'm like, okay. And some were like, yeah, okay, great. Sign me up, you know? Um, and the, the, the kind of beauty of that is, okay, you might hear no more often, but you're getting paid double by less people, which is less time that you have to work, which is less effort, which means I have more time to do the stuff that I want to do. And I'm happy to do the work because I'm getting paid an amount that makes me happy to get on and be like, all right, I'm going to sit on my computer for eight hours and like be happy about it. Cause I just made a shit ton of money. Um, and if you're not feeling those things, if you're like exhausted or you're like, oh, I don't want to do this, <laughs> like you're probably not charging enough. Um, so it's a challenge in existing gigs. You might lose some, but don't be afraid to say, Hey, starting at this date, these are going to be my rates. If this is a problem, let's have a discussion and have a discussion with them. Again, human to human, are they really struggling? Is it something that you believe in so you'll take less money but still feel good about it? Is it something you don't necessarily care about? Like, it's not your baby, it's not your job, it's not your company, you're not, you don't owe them your time, right? <laughs> I love that. And I love that. It's, it's so, I'm, I don't know why uh, it seems to be a popular sentiment, at least. It's like, you know, I hear, pe I hear people say like at my company. And I remember someone said some, something to me that just made it click. It's like, but it's not my company. I'm working with them, actually. Like to, to even say I'm working for them, it just makes it like, uh, you know, like you got your, you know, yeah. you're, you're just, you're you're over um with as far as like your time your time is in another person's hands and i love that you're putting it back in our hands by by bringing those things up so thank you for that amy again like self-reflection and mindset that's what i'm getting from this <laughs> absolutely <laughs> all right so we've got about four more minutes left um i'll do another light pause if anyone else wants to share um a response or a story or has a current situation uh that they'd like some feedback on before we end um, and if not, I'll go through another question. So I'll do a light pause now. Yep, this is Monica. Can you guys hear me okay? Hi, Monica. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, I just am um, getting into um, or returning, I should say, to independent consulting. And I decided that I'd use my prior salary and convert that to an hourly rate and throw that out there. Mm -hmm. um, I try to provide a range, though. Um, 
And I just wondered if other people have tried that and what results they've uh, gotten. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I don't know if other people want to chime in. Otherwise, I guess what my response would be is um, I would actually charge more than your salary as a consultant because companies have to pay other things as an employee for you. So like health insurance, sick time, computers, office space, all of that actually factors in for them as part of what you are compensated for. And so if you go private, then that becomes your responsibility, right? So if you're not, I don't know if you're a consultant for a consultant company or freelance, but if you're freelance, I would actually argue that you should charge more because you're going to have to finance your own technology, your own um, space, your own advertising, marketing, if you have that. Um, and that takes time and it takes money. So. No, that, that's true because, you know, there's always the overhead piece and mm -hmm. from working on cost modeling, I was aware of that. I think I, maybe I was being a little too timid. It was that bad conversation that was going on between my ears probably. So mm -hmm. thank you. For, thank you for rescuing me. <laughs> no worries. My pleasure. Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you. What a, what a great um, response uh, and what a great note to end this one hour chat on. We've got about two more minutes. So I want to pass the mic to you, Amy, and can you give us some food for thought? Um, you know, if we don't remember anything in this hour, what can we remember to just, you know, be more, uh, you know, aligned so that we can put some of these things into practice um, and then let us know how we can connect with you on socials or, you know, however you prefer. Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, just leave us with some food for thought. Yeah, so I have a companion document that I built uh, this morning just because I was thinking, you know, it might be a lot of information kind of thrown at you and you're just like, whoa, what did I just hear? Um, so I made a little document that has like a task list where it's got four things to kind of focus on and think about for yourself and what you're interested in doing. And then it has a section of miscellaneous just like prompts of like, here's some ideas of what might help you get to a spot where you feel like you deserve more. Um, and then I also have another page that has some resources. So hopefully that'll be helpful to come out with the email uh, with the link to this video. So don't feel too challenged if you're like, that was so much. <laughs> I do not remember it all. You don't have to. Um, so hopefully that's enough. But what I would say, if there's one takeaway, the biggest thing is you are worth it. You deserve it. You are worthy. Um, don't be afraid to ask for what you need to make your life better and your life happier and more successful. Um, I have zero doubt that you are worthy. So start there and build off of that. <laughs> yes, I love that. I have like digital confetti coming out uh, on everything right now. So um, we've got some folks who have resonated as well uh, with the whole chat. So thank you again, everyone for joining us this past hour. Um, really appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Amy, so much. Feel free thank to come uh, connect with me and contact me on LinkedIn as well. Amy, I, I have some ideas I wanna throw your way. So I'm gonna definitely be in awesome. touch with you afterwards. Um, and I hope everyone has a great week. Just be looking out for the rewatch email uh, with this beautiful doc that Amy has created and then you can watch the video again.